black and white, wear it over. Despite the heartache of 1970, the Magpies opened the next season in blistering fashion and were unbeaten after seven rounds. Good football, here comes uh, Greening with the long E dummies. He's got a shot. There's a chance for a goal, he'll be missed solid. And he fires, and it's a goal. McKenna was the hottest footy property around. He was kicking plenty of goals, in fact, four times bagged double figures, was a superstar in football mad Melbourne, and was on his way to another century of goals. Capitalising on it, Wayne Richardson comes out, gets it to Tubman, Tubman back to Richardson, beautiful football, great understanding, down towards a mighty Peter McKenna. <laughs> it's only about 30 yards out directly in front, and there is number eight. When you first start in AFL football and you're young, I think you get a bit carried away with your self-importance, but I was, Collingwood supporters were very, very good to me uh, in my time. I suppose I was playing in a glamour position, playing at full forward and kicking goals, and I won a couple of uh, popular player competitions because of Collingwood supporters, and Collingwood supporters were very loyal to me. They were fantastic. There they come. The kids are coming on the ground now. McKenna has kicked his 100th goal. The Magpies would fall off in the latter half of the season, finish fourth, and bowed out to Richmond in the first semi. For Rose, this was it. The champion player had left in his prime. As a coach, he could do nothing more. Bob's record was probably eight years as coach, got the side top five or six times, hasn't got his flag to show, and every one of them were in a position to win the flag. So yeah, yeah, tragic stuff. There could be no other replacement than Neil Mann, for 15 years the loyal and long-suffering deputy. Mann was the obvious choice to help reunite the club, despite calls in many areas for the appointment of the fiery Tuddenham as playing coach. Rose was snapped up by Footscray, Tuddy left for Essendon, where he would breathe fire into the Bombers. In round four, the brilliant John Greening was knocked unconscious by St Jimmy O'Day, 70 metres behind play. He would not play again for two years. O'Day was suspended for 10 matches. McKenna would again be brilliant. For the third year in a row, he topped the century. He even released a record. Under Mann, the club would finish third in 1972 and then, in another September blowout, lose to Richmond and then St Kilda. If there was a bright note, it was the sensational form of Ruckman Len Thompson. The best and most mobile big man in the game won his third Copeland Trophy and the Brownlow Medal as well. To the fairest and best for 1972, Mr. Len Thompson of Collingwood. <laughs> the 10 year rule came into effect in 1973. Tomo asked for more money to stay. Mann took Collingwood into top spot on the ladder. Thompson was again the best big man around and won his fourth Copeland Trophy. McKenna would fall short of his century, finishing with 88 goals. 
they would win 14 of their first 15 games, 19 of 22. After losing to Carlton in the second semi-final, the Magpies dropped McKenna and Price for the preliminary final against Richmond and included a 16-year-old, Rene Kink, for his first game. We'd played Carlton in the second semi at Waverley and I woke up in the Saturday morning shivering. I couldn't believe it. I said to Marita, my wife, well, listen, I think I might be a bit nervous as I mean, I'm shivering. And, uh, and she said, oh, you must be crook. Well, as it turned out, I had the flu. I came up with the flu and I played, my legs felt like jelly. I was told during the week to save my energy for the next week. The paper came out on the Friday morning, out McKenna ill, after I was told I was in the side. Preliminary final against Richmond, a club that I always played well against. Well, to be quite honest, at that particular time I was quite prepared to leave the club. Uh, and I, I really believed I was up to the task and I went out there with a real positive attitude and unfortunately got beaten, but uh, that's football. 16 minute mark rather in the first quarter. There's Dick Clay kicking out, goes straight up the centre. Glorious kick by Clay into the centre, it's punched forward, it goes towards Max Richardson who brilliantly gets it to Thompson. Thompson straight down the centre, the glorious goal by Thompson. Dots kick, it's a beauty right to the edge of the goal square, they set themselves. Jenkins goes up a mile. Here's a go now for a kick. Kick in a bit of trouble. Hooks it over. This is close. It's very close. It's three. That's his second. To the edge of the goal square. Big herds in there. Plenty of big timber. In comes Atkinson. Atkinson hooks it over his shoulder. We're mouth now. Goes to the edge of the goal square. The players fly it to that. Kick. Kick is marked. The kid, the 16-year-old schoolboy from Mount Dead set pressure goal. 20 metres out, he kicks, and it's through. The Magpies were rebuilding. Among the recruits in 1974 would be future captains Peter Moore and Ray Shaw, and a huge crowd favourite for 10 seasons in Billy Picken. Well, even as a kid, I wanted to play with Collingwood. Uh, secondly, to row the Lynn Thompson. Third, to captain the side, and most importantly, fourthly, to uh, win, uh, win the Premiership. It would be the end of the Sharon presidency. To the club would come a man called Ernie Clark. He demanded that tradition be pushed aside, that the old photos be taken from the walls and a new tradition be created. To become a part of this family and we're all very lucky to be given that privilege to be part of the Collingwood family and Clark wasn't a, a part of that a family, he was an outsider and deserves to be criticised for it. I remember it very vividly, it was a very low ebb uh, because there was so much dissension in the club, no one was happy, Ernie Clark was like a tyrant that came in with a, with a strong stick to sort of smack everybody on the backside and uh, it just, football wasn't ready for it unfortunately. Before Sharon departed, he'd lured Murray Wiedemann back from Adelaide to replace Neil Mann as coach. The traditionalist Wiedemann and the free-thinking Clark would prove a volatile mix. Ern got in and tried to shake the club up and uh, to get it out of its lethargy because it's 1958 since they'd won a premiership, they won 53, so it was a long time. And he tried, it could be said he tried to do too much too quickly. The Weed would bring with him a man who would become known almost on arrival as fabulous Phil Carmen a charismatic and brilliant footballer from Norwood. Carmen was a magnificent addition. He passes, oh, it's a beautiful pass. He's looking for Carmen again. They're going a bit Carmen crazy, got the mark. Oh, Carmen was a great player. Uh, I don't think we saw the best of Carmen. He broke his foot against the, in the state game there. He hadn't played for some eight, nine weeks, and we played against the Kilton and kicked 10 goals. He said, just play me full forward. Oh, he was a brilliant player, Carmen. He's not one of the greats I've seen, because I've seen better players of Coleman and uh, Polly Palmer, EJ Whitten, and I've seen better players, but he, he, he was a good player. Down throw in taking place, Moore using a bit of weight against Jones, but Jones had the effective rack work working.